Her voice is so soothing. <laughs> Recording in progress. <laughs> Hi, Sean. <laughs> Hi, Patty. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Good. good. Um, hi, everybody. We're glad to have you with us here today for a special edition. Um, Dina is planning a family birthday, so she couldn't be with us. Um, but but we decided to keep our rhythm going of of meeting after we have our Christian animism potluck meeting for the Ostara gathering. And um, so we're going to do something a little bit different today. We're going to talk about Sean's new-ish book, Prairie yep. Rune. Um, and we've been t batting around doing this for months and we finally said, oh, there you go. I have a Kindle version. So <laughs> mine's... <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so we're just going to talk a little bit about Sean's experience of writing this, about some of our, um, some of our favorite runes and, um, just kind of see where this, where this conversation goes. So I'll just say that, um. I got this book a few months ago and I've read it a couple times. It's a nice short book. So if um, I, I have plenty of friends who feel like their lives are really busy and they can't read a big, long book, this might be a nice fit because it does not take a long time to read it. Each section is very succinct and it's only a few pages long. So it's something that you can read a little bit, meditate on, or you could read it through in, in one session as well. So um, it's just a delightful change of pace. I've never seen a book like this, and mm -hmm. I'm really excited to talk to you more about it. Yeah. So the first thing I want to ask is, how did how did you decide to write this book? Yeah, well, I mean, in some way, thanks, Patty, in some ways it goes way back, because it's a, it's a collaboration between myself and Darcy Blahoot, who is one of my best friends. Darcy and I go back to high school in, in Yorkton, um, and Darcy is a, is a poet and a writer, as well as working his day job. Um, but we've always wanted to collaborate on something, and it's never worked out. Either either one of us has been way too busy, or the project has been more the interest of one than the other, and the pace never just just worked. So so it starts in that desire to to really do a, do something together, do something creative together. And it, but more concretely, um, it was birthed out of also um, my time on the farm. So we had, we had been living, uh, my family and I had been living off the grid on a, a farm north of the Battlefords, um, uh, which took me back, sort of back in time, back in history, back to, down through the levels of my own cultural roots, just because of the way of life. Um, you know, living without electricity, living without running water, like living, living in some ways as close to, you know, what my ancestors would live, whatever, however we want to talk about that. Um, and exploring at the same time, some of the, some roots of language, because one of the things I had been hearing from a lot of Indigenous folks and Indigenous elders was how important their language was in terms of holding the spirit of their culture um and you know you just have to talk with an elder for a little while or, or read some indigenous writings on language where you see how there are there are words in an indigenous language that just encapsulate these amazing cultural spiritual linguistic land-based ecological animistic things all in like one word and i thought well do we have anything like that and that led me to um, to the runes, to in particular the the, the Anglo-Saxon Boothor, which is a, a runic alphabet in the same family of alphabets as the um, the Elder Futhark, uh, the G Germanic, and um, some Norse forms of runes. They're all interrelated, but that's that's what sort of got the the birth the birth of the book going. That's that's beautiful. I remember when my son was little, we had one of those illustrated encyclopedias that, you know, are available at the library and lots of yeah. kids have. And he stumbled on the pages that talked about the Phoenician alphabet. Yeah. And he spent weeks copying down these symbols and was absolutely mesmerized that this one little symbol could represent so many things in a language and for him i want to say he was i'm sure he was under 10 years old he was just fascinated with it and it actually led him to want to learn a little bit about greek so we found right. a like a like a very very basic greek um 
textbook so that he could start learning. And I started learning with him and nice. loved seeing and those Greek symbols are much more familiar to us because there's so many things that translate into our um, English. So the idea that there are symbols that capture these ideas is beautiful and powerful. And yet something that I think most of us are completely unaware of, yeah. um, except that people who maybe read Tolkien or or are into those kinds of things knew about runes in terms of Middle Earth and that sort of thing. And it seemed like it was just a magical made up world, but yeah. really there are languages that are built on these symbols yeah. um, and they're, they, they, they can kind of show up a poverty in our own language because it's very literal and very direct one-to-one -one object to um, things. And I, I think there are beautiful things about the English language, but these representative languages are, are quite different. Mm -hmm. So well, I'm wondering- The irony is oh. that this is our language, like at, at the roots of English is this room poem, but it's like, you got to excavate it underneath layers and layers and layers of sort of what I call exploitative Mick English, right? Mick English? Mick English. Like, what is like it? The Mick world, oh, like the McDonald, like, McDonaldization like, of, of globalization that, <laughs> that sort of colonizes all of our imaginations. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. And to, to have our imaginations taken in different ways and to be able to think about things in different ways is a fundamental part of Christian animism because you have to rethink the singular categories that have been given to us about what's animate, what's inanimate, what has being, what doesn't. Exactly. Um, so this is a beautiful exercise in exploring that a little bit more. Okay. So just out of curiosity, do you have one or two favorite chapters that you wrote? There, you know, I love them all. Honestly, I love them all, part, partly because of the process that we went through. I mean, Darcy and I would go back and forth uh, you know, trying to a trying to figure out the original of the the little the little room poem. It's just a short old Anglo-Saxon thing. With doing the translation bit around that, and then b bouncing ideas back and forth. I would say I think one of my favorites is actually the first one, which is um, Fail, which uh, about cattle. It, it sort of sets the tone off really really well. But there are many more. Gifu the uh, gift is a is a strong one for me um uh, and then uh, of course and well ethel home mm -hmm. is is a good one too it's it it's one that sort of speaks in some ways about some of the problematic na nature of the runes too because runes since the early 20th century have had a revival part of which has been an appropriation by the far right in terms of white supremacy and stuff so this this room ethel which is about home or homeland um mm. has been taken over in some ways by you know what, let me just let me just interrupt and say that the book um is set up so that there is a representation of each of the runes and then there's a little um a little explanation of it including the a translation of the poem followed by a poem that i'm assuming either one or both of you wrote together to sort of interpret your own understanding of what it is just right. for people who who haven't seen the book yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the voices of interpretation are I always do the prose and then Darcy who's a poet always does the poem that follows the prose. So Got that's it. our that's our rhythm. And and the and the the prose is yeah, like you say sort of an explanation or interpretation of the the old Anglo-Saxon poem, which is usually just a poem, very short poem of three lines, almost like an oracle. Like a, like a little haiku. A like little a little bit haiku. haiku. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So, well, I, I, I resonated with a number of them. Um, what's the one for Poplar? Uh, Bayork. Bayork. Yeah, I, I liked, liked that one too. I liked that one. Um, but the one I was drawn to was Sophia. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the the poem or the the runic runic poem, I guess. Mm -hmm. God is love, and her body is all creation. She is a tree of life who gathers her children in love. Mm -hmm. Um. Tell me about writing that one. Yeah. So this one is the the rune that that closes the book, 
and it's the rune that is that is utterly modern. So this is not this this is a I, I hesitate to say made up, but it's a it's a, a rune that was gifted to me um, in inspiration. I'd say probably fifteen or twenty years ago, and it's just becomes sort of the foundation of my own spirituality, uh, and and it's at the root of a lot of my Christian animism, and it's about this notion of. of Sophia or the Holy Spirit being the tree of life in and of herself and and that somehow all of the other runes um, and all of the other language symbols and all of the other you know uh, life-giving symbols from all over the world somehow hang on Sophia on this tree as leaves on on the one world tree so yeah that's why for me it is such a powerful rune and it's it's uh, I thought it was a good way for us to close out the the collection of the book. Out the book. What kind of feedback have you heard? Have you talked to people who have read the book? Have you, I, I don't know if you've been giving presentations about it or like, I don't know what's happened since it came yeah, out. Yeah, it's, so we haven't done our formal launch yet. Um, we're going to do uh, in, because it's, it's self-published. And so you have to deal with all of the different moving pieces, including um, figuring out a bit of a, a book tour type schedule. So it didn't work out for us to actually do something a bit more major until May. So it, the book will have had almost six months of, of life. We've done um, one public reading, and I know that the book has, has uh, made its rounds through other small groups, and there's um, you know been some folks online that have made comments. By and large, the, the response is really good. I mean, some sometimes it's I hear to begin with a bit of confusion about like what what are the roots like what where does that even come from mm -hmm. um, and I just really enjoy explaining that because it gets gets you into all types of different cultural pieces. Um, I think one of the things that we that has become very apparent, especially with people res people's responses to Darcy's poems, the poems that he writes in response to my prose reflections is he's working with an oral culture piece. So you can read it on the page a number of times and it's like, wow, what's going on there? Um, read it out loud or um, like Janice has had her, her book group read, read uh, one or two of the poems together, read it out loud and start hearing the language um, and it comes alive and much better, which is totally appropriate to um, the, the old, old English or Anglo-Saxon culture, right? It was a tribal culture where a lot of the tradition was um, orality, it was storytelling around the fire. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that hits on something that is challenging for modern eyes who haven't thought about this. Oftentimes, like we are really into emojis. We are yeah. really into symbols that that indicate something very directly those are really a kind of modern rune. Yeah. Um, and when we when we look at these symbols, we don't have a hook on which to hang what they yeah. mean. And so right. it can be off-putting to say, well, how am I going to relate to this? How am I going to understand? It's not like I could learn this and write a note to somebody. Exactly. Um, and yeah. so yeah. people aren't quite yeah. sure how to how to engage, but having this yeah. sort of broadening of our imagination that, that we had just mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah. And um, I've got to give credit to the community that communities that have really been working on reviving familiarity with the runes, and that's largely within um, within neo pagan communities who have done a, in many ways a beautiful job at both giving life to this old runic system um, and connecting it to modern sensibilities, connecting it to ecological realities doing their best like I've a big shout out to the group called heathens against hate who take on white supremacy right from the get-go and, and provide a form of inclusive um neo-paganism and neo-heathenry so i really i shout out to them it's like this is might be the first time that christians have tried to to um rejuvenate the runic script but the the our our pagan companions have been doing it for a while now and are these are these folks that you're in contact or just that you know of? Are they both? both. Some are folks yeah. that I just, I only read their stuff or, or, you know, follow podcasts and stuff. Some are folks that I've corresponded with about the, uh, uh, 
you know, to get their feedback on the text, on the, uh, you know, on how they work with runes. Um, so yeah, it's, and it's funny because runes now potentially can become a bit of a, maybe a common language and a common, uh, some common ground for, you know, two groups that have been historically pretty alienated from each other. Yeah. And finding, finding ways to make those connections. Was yeah. it about, if sometime during lockdown, was it a couple of years ago that, that, that we had the panel on the Christian animism um, council of pagans and yeah. Christians? Yeah. Yeah. That was during lockdown. Yeah. It was. Okay. So gosh, that's two or three years ago now, which it sounds like a long time ago, We're but that was a really be... beautiful conversation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think there in specific we had there were a couple of it was a Thawane one and it was like there were a couple of uh couple of witch folks who were who were on and engaged. So and some of them have stayed involved with the, the Christian animism. So it yeah. yeah, it's a it's a good piece of um bridge building. Yeah, to to listen, learn, mm -hmm. make connections rather than having having alienation. Yeah. Um, so is there another rune in particular that you resonate with in especially? Eeyore, which is um which is technically it's water fish, but it's beaver. Beaver. I love that rune. Um partially because beavers are as close as I might get to um uh, uh you know what we used to call a totem animal. Now I probably wasn't comfortable calling it a spirit. But that's on page fifty eight, your beaver. Got it. I found it. So what 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 speaks to you about this one? So this one has connections for me both in terms of my personal growing up, and I and I recount in the in the prose reflection a bit about um, how I was around beavers a lot, and there was actually one particular beaver that I had this really close relationship to. Um, but then it's also I in the reflection I go into how in in Turtle Island on Turtle Island. The fur trade, which saw the slaughter of beaver pop decimation of the beaver population, um, that really disturbed a, a lot of indigenous um, elders as well. Were like, we can't. This is not good. We they were part of it. They were part of the fur trade. They were active partners in the fur trade. But there were a lot of their elders that said, this is not right. This is way out of balance. I speak of it in some ways as a little bit of an original fall of on Turtle Island when when the beginnings of mercantile capitalism from Europe came over, started taking root. Um, and yeah, this 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 trade relationship based on the decimation of, of this sacred beast. And uh, the beaver is actually sacred to a number of different uh, indigenous groups. And and certainly just a you know we know now where beaver are being rehabilitated and i know in in england they've got some of their first beavers back that are that are creating dams creating waterways they are the best healers of our our um, various wetlands that that we could ever have so they're magical beasts in many ways and, and yeah that's what makes me love this particular rune in your exploration and th those stories of of restoring things like like beavers to their natural habitat and the and the knock on effect that it has on impacting water wetlands and um, the overall well being and decreasing flooding and stuff is really powerful. Um, complicated with the way we've yep. carved up so many places. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yes, thank you for sharing that. Do you have any sense? You know, I I look at this rune and and i realize this is not drawn by a hand it's drawn by a computer mm -hmm. um and so many of these i can't really see where the connection is and i look as a fairly li literal literally minded person for better or for worse there are strengths and challenges in that um i don't see ways to look at many of these to say oh sure that makes sense to me how that right. makes a beaver or whatever right did you grapple with that? Have you found anything? I I, I grappled with that because sometimes, so the way the runes function is very interesting. So this is back in, in within the first first millennium CE, largely, is the when the runes were really functioning. 
they do function as a phonetic alphabet. So they are, they are, do represent sounds. And those sounds usually um, are the first letters of the old Anglo-Saxon or, or pre-Germanic root words. Okay. So they're, they, they're not entirely sim symbols. Like they're not entirely pictographic. Some of them are like Eeyore, if you really look carefully. Um, so it's that line and then, sort of a cross through it sure. you can sort so of four legs the, four legs <laughs> the head and the, and the tail yeah um for something like man which is which is uh the root which for human but if the old english word is actually man where we get man from um mm -hmm. you do get an m there bayork is definitely there's a it's a b um and that's uh, which is interesting because it's often interpreted as poplar, but it could be interpreted as birch too. So some of it is um, is more uh, phonetic sounds than it is pictographs. Yeah, definitely. And oh, it was sense. it was used as a working alphabet. So oftentimes you will find it on headstones in graveyards or land markers sometimes on artifacts like swords or or helms like old um helmets and that okay yeah yeah I, I, what i found is as i've worked with them over time including doing a, a form of <laughs> sort of like runic yoga called stab it's a very modified form of stab where you actually make the rune signs with your body Hmm. As I've done that over the years, all of a sudden, like the, the, these runes take on more of a sense that they are they are alive, even if they don't, um, even if they're not symbolically like really recognizable. But you start to just I start to feel it, feel them in my body. That is fascinating. And I, I have to confess that when you said that, all I could think of was people at wedding receptions going, why am <laughs> like, Hey, it's sort of like that. It's sort of like the that. closest I've ever come. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so I guess, um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see how this book you know, where conversations go and to hear more as you do the official launch and everything. I'm just really yeah. excited to see where this 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 goes. And I'm thrilled for you because I know you've worked on this for a long time. It was a labor um, of love, yeah. Absolutely. Well, and to do this with your friend and then to have your son involved, what a yeah. what a gift to have yeah. this sort of labor of love of yeah. something that pulls together so many strands of things that you mm -hmm. have been committed to for a long time. Yeah. Um, so I appreciate that you have shared this learning and understanding with the rest of us. Um, I'm wondering, so there might be somebody who's watching this, who's like, yeah, whatever runes, uh, <laughs> give me your elevator pitch of what you would say to somebody who's a little skeptical, doesn't really quite get it. Why, why should they read this? So the, the why grows out of a, I think a challenge that I have heard from indigenous elders for a long time. Uh, the challenge has been, and this has been doing reconciliation work. The challenge that I've heard has been, you white folks need to figure out where you come from. Because there's a sense in which um, Euro-based cultures who are now transplanted to Turtle Island have forgotten our roots. Um, we And so we've cut ourselves off from some real deep sources, linguistic, cultural, and spiritual sources, which leave us sort of high and dry and leave us not very good neighbors for the folks, both, both more than human and human indigenous neighbors who are here on Turtle Island. So, so I think that would be the elevator pitch. It's a why around a commitment to figuring out who we are so that we can be better neighbors here and now. And if somebody was to say, "Well, my my ancestry don't tr my ancestry doesn't trace back to old English places. My in no, ancestry yeah. is Middle That's, Europe or something." Sure. Is, and, does and that actually, matter? It in some ways yes, in some ways no. So Darcy is of Ukrainian background. He doesn't really consider himself Anglo-Saxon. So in two ways it matters. A um, English is the now the mother tongue and the lingua franca for for many of us, even if it's not our cultural heritage. 
But B, if you look at how this is, how we've experimented with this in English to old English, it may give you as a Ukrainian, as a Czechoslovakian, as a Polish person, as an Italian person, it may give you the inspiration to go back into your own cultural heritage because most languages have something like this where language was much more organic and much more connected to the to the spirit world and to the um, ecological world beautiful yeah. well thank you so much for talking about this i'm going to close us with um something from the wisdom of solomon mm. about mm. wisdom yeah which was a that... big inspiration to my thoughts around sophia yeah, the, absolutely the absolutely and this is all about wisdom God has given certainty in understanding the way things are, the organization of the universe and the working of the elements, the beginning and end of an era, and all that occurs in between, the cycles of the solstices and the changing of the seasons, the circle of the year and the positions of the stars, the nature of animals and the instincts of wild beasts, the power of spirits and the thoughts of human beings, the uses of plants and the properties of roots. Whether it was hidden or apparent, I learned it all, for wisdom was my teacher, and it was she who designed all of these things. For wisdom moves more swiftly than motion itself. She is so pure that she pervades and permeates all living things. She is a breath of the power of God, a pure light of the glory of the Most High, and nothing that is base can come into her present in secret. She is the light that shines forth from everlasting light, the flawless mirror of the dynamism of God and the perfect image of the Holy One's goodness. Though alone of her kind, she can do all things. Though unchanging, she renews all things. Generation after generation, she enters into holy souls and makes them friends of God and prophets. For God loves the one who finds a home in wisdom. She is more beautiful than the sun and more magnificent than all the stars in the sky. When compared with daylight, she excels in every way, for the day always gives way to night, but wisdom never gives way to evil. She stretches forth her power from one end of the earth to the other and gently puts all things in their proper place. Love it. And that's from the Bible. That's what we're talking about. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about. <laughs> all right. Well, thank, thank you, you so, so much, much John. I appreciate the, the it's conversation. So, and likewise, I appreciate the conversation. I can't wait to be back with the three of us. And yeah. Um, Glad, glad, glad we had this opportunity. Right on. Well, take care, everybody. Until next time.